Hello friends, this is MK here. In our last video we tested some cheap no-name Chinese SSDs. Some of you commented and requested us to test some quality SSDs. Unfortunately, quality SSDs cost a lot of money, which we do not always have. On top of that, on YouTube you can always find tests for any particular quality drive that you're considering for a purchase. So in this video, we decided to tell you how to choose a good SSD in general and what parameters you should pay attention to. But first, a little info on those no-name SSDs from AliExpress. They attract people's attention with their prices. Often for just 15 bucks you can get a 120 GB SSD, and doubling this amount will get you three times as much memory. However, considering such solutions as main drives is a bad idea. And it's not just that these are ordinary SATA SSDs, in any case they will be significantly faster than classic hard drives. The problem is in their quality. Such drives are made literally of rejected semiconductor chips, which for one reason or another were not suitable for solutions by famous manufacturers. Small Chinese shops purchase them, run some tests, but I'm not sure it's accurate, install the cheapest controllers they can find, and sell them. Yes, you may get lucky and such an SSD will work for you for more than a year, but there is always a chance that the newly purchased drive will have problems out of the box, and in about a year it will die, taking all your data with it into its silicon grave. Does it mean that you shouldn't get those cheap SSDs on AliExpress? Not quite. It is definitely not worth considering them as the main system drive though. Similarly, you should not consider them if you want to store some sensitive data on them. However, if you want to store some games or other things that are of no particular importance to you, that you can always download from the web should you lose them, it's definitely a way to save a buck. On the other hand, SSDs by well-known manufacturers are not that much more expensive now. For example, if you want to liven up your old PC or laptop, you can consider inexpensive SATA SSDs, such as the Crucial BX500. If you need a capacious SSD to store half of your Steam library, look for a 1TB SSD, such as Kingston A2000 or Data XPG. And if your work involves moving large files around all day long, you can go to the top league and choose the Samsung 980 Pro. Yes, it's quite expensive, but the ability to move terabytes of data in a matter of minutes, it's well worth it. So, you have found the SSD that suits you, but how to learn about its performance, heating and reliability, other than in the product description? Read tests and watch reviews, but are you sure that the tests and reviews you've just read are for the one particular SSD that you're considering? People believe that after its release, a piece of hardware will not change anymore. If you buy a processor a couple of years after its release and the first reviews, it will still be the same processor with the same performance. The situation with SSDs used to be the same. The reviews would allow you to find out the exact name of the controller, the type of memory, cache size, heating, read and write speeds, in short, to get a complete picture of the drive in question. However, it is no longer the case. The manufacturers are trying to cheat us. What do we mean by that? A well-known company releases a new SSD. People buy it, websites and channels make their reviews on it, and so on. Often, if the drive turns out to be popular, people would make a lot of noise about it. And when you don't expect it, the manufacturer would change the parts the drive is made of without changing its name. And of course the changes made would be for the worse. And then you buy it, install it into your PC, and realize that the drive does not work the way it should. Attempting to return such an SSD would most likely fail. More often than anything, the memory chips get replaced. The 3-bit TLC chips are quite expensive, so manufacturers would use the cheaper 4-bit QLC chips in more capacious versions of the same drives, the problem of which is extremely low read and write speeds when going beyond the buffer size. And when I say low, I mean that they are low even by AGD standards. The write speed can often be 100 or even 50 megabytes per second. This while the manufacturer promises about 2000 megabytes per second. So how do you avoid such a pig in a poke? sort reviews by date and pay attention to the most recent ones. At the slightest suspicion, it is better to avoid such an SSD. Fortunately, there are plenty other manufacturers on the market. Solid-state drives are a fairly new product on the PC components market, so their performance has been growing at a pace much more rapid than that of other components. If 5 years ago the speed of 2 GB per second seemed mind-blowing, the current drives have already reached 6 to 7 GB per second. Some of them have even got close to 15 GB per second, which is quite close to the DDR4 RAM. Of course, this makes SATA SSD users, with only a few hundreds megabytes per second, feel a bit uncomfortable. But we hasten to reassure you, for a home PC, even a very fast one, such speeds are simply an overkill. 
For example, Sony assured us at their presentation of the PlayStation 5 that their super cool in-house SSD with a fancy data compression technology connected directly to the processor and providing read speeds of up to 9 gigabytes per second would turn the world upside down and make you forget about loading screens. But what do we have in practice? Not so long ago, Sony allowed third-party SSDs to be connected to its console, and tests quickly showed that a faster SSD does not give any real advantage. Thus, for example, when installing a Western Digital 750SE SSD, which provides a speed of only 3.2 GB per second, that is, twice as low, the real difference in load speed was only hundreds of milliseconds. Only one game showed a difference of 2 seconds. Call such a difference mind-blowing, I would not. PC users went as far as to test and compare SATA, PCIe 3.0 and PCIe 4.0 SSDs. The result was kind of predictable. Yes, the cheaper and slower SATA turned out to be slower indeed, by as much as half a second, sometimes even one second. But why is that? Why does a 10 times faster drive affect the systems and games performance so little? First, often the bottleneck is somewhere else, because it is only the SSDs that have changed so dramatically in their performance in recent years. Processors and graphics cards are much more conservative in this regard, because they have been on the market for much longer. Second, do not forget that the previous generation of Xbox on PlayStation runs on AGDs. The creators of games and game engines have to take this into account and optimize their creations to be able to run on machines with hard drives well enough. Therefore, when a game engine gets an SSD at its disposal, even a very cheap one, which in any case is a lot faster than an HDD when working with small files and it has better latency, said game engine just goes crazy and doesn't know what to do with such performance. You can easily see it by looking at the load graph of your SSD when loading a game. Even cheap SATA solutions seldom load by more than a half. Whereas top-notch PCIe 4.0 drives are often sitting almost idle while loading a game level. So the verdict here is simple. If you don't work with hundreds of gigabytes of data every day, you shouldn't go for top-tier drives and pay more than you have to. We are already used to the fact that processors and graphics cards heat up a lot and require cooling, but it still seems surprising for many that SSDs are also not the coolest guys out there and similarly require attention. Actually, from a logical standpoint, it does make sense. Controllers of fast SSDs often process gigabytes of data per second, and they have to compress the data from the SLC cache into TLC often at the same time as they read or write data. And it leads to the fact that top-tier SSD controllers often have four or even five fast ARM cores with a TDP of dozens of watts, and this already requires at least some kind of heatsink. Will the drive work without it? Sure. However, you need to understand that with a serious workload such as archiving, working with Windows updates or installing games, such an SSD can quickly heat up to a critical temperature and start thermal throttling, which means lose its performance. Therefore, if you got a top-end drive like a Western Digital 850 or Samsung 980 Pro and there was no heatsink coming with it, do not be greedy. It wouldn't make too much of a difference if you spent some extra couple of dollars and get a heatsink. Or your motherboard may actually have one, remember to use it in this case. Still, remember that the above applies only to high-speed NVMe SSDs. Simple SATA solutions do not need any extra cooling at all. What is an SSD in its shell? Many will say that this is a controller and some flash memory chips connected to it. And it's correct. A lot of them really only have two of these components, which are of course essential for an SSD. However, there can be a third important component, the DRAM cache. In fact, this is a small RAM chip, often less than 1 GB of memory, connected to the controller. What is its purpose? It stores a table of addresses of the data stored in the drive. This allows it to reduce the number of instances when it has to request the information about free and occupied memory cells from the memory chip. This means that an SSD with a DRAM cache will work faster with a constant flow of data to it, which we can see in practice. Therefore, if you are looking for an SSD better than a simple SATA drive, you should pay attention to the presence of a DRAM cache on it. Oftentimes those that have it cost just a bit more than those that don't. At the same time they are noticeably more stable and fast in operation. There are such SSDs that eat away part of your computer's RAM and use it as DRAM cache. This technology is called host memory buffer. One of the most famous representatives of such drives is a fairly popular Samsung 980, which in theory can run at speeds of up to 3 GB per second. Of course, this technology will not replace a full-fledged DRAM cache. Firstly, the maximum amount of memory taken from RAM rarely exceeds 32 or 64 megabytes. 
that is, it will be possible to make a table of addresses only for 32 or 64 gigabytes of flash memory, which is usually an order smaller than the total volume of the drive. Secondly, the PC RAM is located farther away than the chip on the board of the SSD itself, so the delay when accessing such a cache is higher. But still, having host memory buffer is better than nothing. So what have we got here? TLC memory is good, QLC is worse. It is not worth it getting cheap Chinese SSDs, but if you really want to, use them only for non-sensitive data like games. It is not worth it overpaying for fast NVMe SSDs if you don't work with a lot of data on a daily basis. And if you do, don't forget to get a heatsink if it wasn't included. My name is Mikhail Kroshin. I'll see you again. Bye.